Welcome to the Healing Health Podcast. I'm Amber Petty. In this episode, I'll be talking to Professor Anna Peters, Director of Deakin University's Institute for Health Transformation. We sat down to discuss how changing the way our food systems operate can improve population health. So now, join us in the conversation. What I'm interested to start with is finding out what are the biggest health issues and diseases in Australia that specifically, if our food and and our diet was better, would be lessened, the burden would be lessened? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's really clear that unhealthy diet contributes to some of the biggest contributors to burden of disease in Australia, as you said, particularly through the big diseases that everybody knows about. So cancer is Mm. is strongly affected by unhealthy diets, cardiovascular disease through type 2 diabetes, and also mental health. Right. So that's an interesting one, isn't it? I think in terms of mental health, we don't have a great understanding. It's very complex. But you're saying in terms of research that mental health and food are very closely linked? Yeah, no, it's really clear that healthier diets are associated with much better mental health across a whole range of different types of mental health outcomes. And even including, we know in schools, you know, children are much more attentive and able to participate and have a good experience at school. So there's a lot around nutrition and school retention and scores. So there's a wide range of both health, but also social outcomes that we know are associated with healthier diets. Mm. One of the things when I was reading about your research and what you do was the the term food environment, which I know is very linked to your research. What does food environment actually mean? Yeah, I think that this is really critical. So exactly as you just said, I think there's a really strong awareness now that mm. it's better to eat a healthier diet. Mm. And actually, I think that's across almost all sections of the population. The issue is that knowing that is not enough in our current food environments, Mm. as we call them. And what we mean by the food environment is basically everywhere that any of the citizens across Australia purchase or eat food. Mm. And if you just think about a daily you know, trip through <laughs> through life from home to work, back home again, you'll know that every time you see a billboard or if you drive through a service station or if you pop into a local cafe or a supermarket, all the things that are two-for-one specials, they're going to be the soft drinks and the chocolate mm. bars and the chips, the unhealthier food. Everywhere you go, you'll see the big billboards for the unhealthier food, really preferencing us to, to consume or buy unhealthy over healthy options. So although we know that eating healthier is, is really good, it's really hard for us to do it. And a consequence of that is that it's really amazing to me that in Australia, over one third of our energy intake comes from what we would call junk food. Wow. Across everybody, all ages, across the country. We don't know the triggers and where these influences are coming at us. As you said, the minute we walk into a service station, cafes, if we're kind of trying to be more mindful of um, how we react to decisions about food, where are our biggest environments? That is where people, I think, are a little clueless. No, absolutely. And I think there's been a big focus on, you know, individual people, individual citizens taking responsibility for their own health. And of course, there's a role for that. But as I said, I think we have come quite far there. I think a lot of people do know basically what a healthy diet is. So now we have to work with the change makers, as I call them, who really have control over what we are more likely to want to purchase and want to eat and driven to Mm. eat because it looks cheaper, more convenient, Mm. more available sexier. Mm. (laughs) You know, if you look at teenagers, all the apps from um, all the fast food giants, they have these amazing deals. You come in and buy one thing and your 10 friends get something free. So there are huge drivers for us to purchase and eat unhealthy food. So in terms of your question, who are these, um, who are the drivers at the moment, which could be the change agents? So I think um, although government is not a, a, you know, kind of key provider of the, the food system, mm. um, they obviously have a lot of control and a lot of opportunity to intervene. So mm. we need to see a lot of leadership from the government. But the groups that I'm really interested to work with are within the food system itself. And so there you are talking about the supermarkets, um, food retail outlets. So that's things like the cafe down the, the road, yeah. the fast food giant, um, the small cafe in your health service. So they're really the areas, I think, where we can start to see change. So we know that about two-thirds of um, all food is purchased through supermarkets in mm. Australia. So that's a huge avenue that we have to address. Mm. But we also know that people really develop habits over a lifetime, 
when they come into contact with food at their childcare centre, at their school, when they go to hospital, when they go to the sport and rec centre. So although um, those areas don't make up the majority of our food, I think they're really influential for setting mm. habits for a lifetime. Yeah, that's that's what it is, isn't it? it it's habits because you can you can literally go, okay, well, I'm now a bit more influenced to eat more salad or fruit because my supermarket is putting that front and centre and they realise there's a movement for that so they're trying to not look like the perpetrators of the bad food as potentially they have in, in, in the past. But then the minute I go to my gym, if if I have a sort of, you know, history of having a hot chocolate after or, or you know, whatever is or being sort of... a sports drink. A spo- that, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's huge. Yes, that's right. A sports drink, then I'm going I'm gonna to very quickly go, it's safe, that's what I normally do, this is my ritual. Yeah. No, we've, so that's a really good area to think about. So we've worked with the YMCA across Victoria. Mm-hmm. They've got, you know, around 50 different sport and recreation centres and they were real leaders in this area. So a few years ago they decided that it was their responsibility to their communities, to mm-hmm. their participants, to not just provide the sports side of, of health and wellbeing but to really provide the healthy diet side of health, of health and wellbeing. And so they made a commitment to take all sugary drinks out of every single YMCA centre. Wow. And they've done that. It's, they've all gone. And one of the big challenging areas was sports drinks. Um, and so they've really moved now to make sure that they're not sold to children and that they're really reduced in availability. So taking the sugar drinks out of the YMCAs or whatever sort of food, you know, is, is not great for you, I would imagine to have them there, they would make have made money from having those drinks there in the past and not sure, but, you know, is there incentives to have certain energy drinks or st- stuff like that sort of vying for retail space? Do they take financial kind of hits? Like are they putting their money where their mouth is with, with a decision like that? Yeah. So that's really the basis of one of my big research programs at the moment is to try and have a look at which initiatives um, those people like the YMCA or your health service can Mm -hmm. take so that they provide healthier food for their customers without taking a huge financial hit. So it's a really new research area. And my goal is to see, can we find some interventions that are win-wins for the Mm -hmm. provider, the, the retailer and the consumer? And in fact, what the YMCA found, so we did the evaluation of that, and what they found was overall there wasn't a financial hit. Oh. And that's because the customers basically bought what was available. <laughs> oh, okay. So while before they did buy the sugary drinks, yeah. after they just bought something else like bubbly water, basically, yeah. is what they, what they switched to. But having said that, both um, the YMCA and Alfred Health, which is a really good example, I think, of leadership in this area, they both went into the big changes they made with clear statements from the top, saying they were doing this for the health and well-being of their communities. They felt a responsibility to their communities. And even if there was a financial hit, they would take that. So yes, they were putting their money where their mouth is. Mm. But as it turned out, neither of them had to because the healthy options sold just as well. Right. What about looking at hospitals? Over the last couple of years, I it was in and out of hospitals quite a lot with my father who had type 2 diabetes. He also had Alzheimer's. He, he couldn't have had a, a worse diet over his lifetime. He was addicted to sugar. There's no two ways about it. And um, But what is always sort of so conflicting, especially when that's specifically the issue with your ill loved one, is it felt like everything that, you know, if he'd say go and get me a snack or something, it was all junk. Like it felt like a lot of it was junk. Isn't that a bit contradictory? I mean, do the cafes or within the, the, the hospitals run separately? Like isn't there some sort of ecosystem that would make a lot more sense? <laughs> well, that's what I think. But yeah. as, So it is really interesting. Like as a researcher, I have found that um, trying to work in this space, it's been kind of tricky because a lot of people say, yeah, well, of course, sport and rec centres and health services should food, sell healthy food. Yeah, but they haven't. That's a no-brainer. Yeah. And then, yes, I have to say, but they haven't been yeah. traditionally. And so what we're trying to do is build research that supports them to make those changes. And I have to say over the last five years, so a number of the state governments around Australia have passed guidelines. Um, You know, in the last two years, New South Wales Health actually mandated changes to all their health services to meet healthy food guidelines. But that's only in the last two years. Mm. So I think there's increasing recognition that there are some core pillars of our society Mm. that really should make sure that they're putting health and wellbeing of their constituents first above everything. Mm. But what we're finding in that journey is that they might be able to do that and still make a business profit. Yeah, yeah. And they should be able to make a profit. It's just 
that I think that they shouldn't be contradicting what their service is and what they care about while also offering sort of junk. Yeah, so one of the really lovely things that happened in our um, research with Alfred Health Service was interviewing some of the retailers that had made the changes to healthier Ah. food. And just a couple of really quick stories. So one of the people who was responsible for making the change he, he admitted that he was really resistant at the beginning because mm. he was really worried consumers wouldn't want to buy the healthy options. Mm. And he said it's made such a significant difference to his personal life overseeing this change really? because now he sees himself as part of the solution, not part of the problem. And so I think that it's really moving. Wow. But it's also really important because it shows that for business leaders, cafe owners and managers, there are other drivers for, for their businesses. Yeah. If they can still break even yeah. <laughs> um, and do good, that actually means a lot to them. And uh, there was another story which was one of the chefs actually basically said he used to have some of the um, the tradies who would come in every day and wanted to eat the, the unhealthy food. Mm. And he said to them, look, I've got all these salads just for me. Just try them instead of the hot chips. If you yeah. don't like them, you go back to the hot chips. And he said it was the best thing he'd ever seen because now they bring in all their mates and they eat the salads. Wow. And it's that mentality of what is treating yourself, which is often um, what you've grown up with knowing, which is a hamburger, a sausage roll, um, you know, the chocolate milk. That's right. I mean, I think what you're talking about is what I find exciting about all the research I'm doing. It's trying to find the culture shift. Yeah. The culture shifts for the, fascinating. the health services, for the cafe owners yeah. and for the consumers. And what is it that we can do to help that culture shift? Yeah. And so in terms of your particular question around the tradies, at the moment we're focusing on big organisations like supermarkets and health services yeah. and schools. Um, and so that that's not a focus yet. But what we're hoping is that once we find some really good examples of um, healthy food retail mm. that are viable, then, then we can spread those to the local corner store, the local cafe. But mm. I do also know that there's some of the big freight companies, for example, you know, they've taken this on. So they're all providing free lunches to their workers that are healthy. So there's a real wow. shift now, I think, in terms of a sense of responsibility from corporations to their workers. And why would that be? What would what would influence them to suddenly care so much about their um, about their workers? Is it mental health and and the understanding that 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 you know food is related to that? And how how is that message? If it is that or it's not, how has that message got to them? Is it literally through people like yourself or organisations going and having the conversations with the leaders of these companies? Yeah, basically. So it's it's the physical and the mental health. So yeah. you know. Two thirds of men in that kind of age bracket are overweight or obese in Australia, yeah, and right. we know that. Wow, say like with freight, like that's a really sedentary <clears throat> job. You know, you're sitting in a yes. truck for hours on end. So I think it's become really clear that a lot of the the kind of work claims that these companies are getting for physical and mental health are potentially diet and physical activity related. Wow. And so if they don't start to intervene, they're the ones that really are, are on the on the kind of wrong end of the stick. And see, now that, you know, now that I'm understanding food environments uh, more, obviously it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realise that truck drivers, their food environments would largely be petrol stations, exactly wouldn't it? Exactly right, exactly right. So they're yep. literally sort of driving into the, the mouths of these businesses who can influence... Um, what they buy that's pretty right. quickly. That's right. And that's exactly why, you know, I know that one um, particular trucking company has taken this on and they have, as I said, free lunch available in the lunchroom for all their drivers and bags of lunch to take away for exactly that reason because they wow. felt they couldn't take on <laughs> the yeah. chain of servos along the route. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that's our responsibility. You know, government and research and advocates, they do need to take on mm. that chain of service stations mm. so that every truckie, you know, every commuter mm. has the best opportunity opportunity for healthy food that's nice and yummy yeah. and they like it <laughs> yeah yeah because if you've got a hundred workers you've got a hundred different people that have grown up with different environments and different programming it'd be very hard to st- suddenly have one message that really drills into them um, in terms of their individual decisions if it was left over to them that's right and we need to be supplying the options we need to be finding some new you know options that are able to be sold from a service station like it is hard with fresh fruit mm. Mm. fresh food it's perishable so we do need the supply chain to change we need, we need some new options that people enjoy so they like the taste and they're healthy and they're affordable and they're available so so yeah it's not just about the individual the whole system has to change to, to make those op- options available. It seems like in service stations, I've certainly noticed 
the kind of war between the likes of Woolworths and Coles to very quickly come across as who's the healthy food um, option. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to be this sort of like, you know, on steroids health food shop. But I think one of the two is doing it way better. And that's also literally use of colours and logos and clever things like that that an advertising person, you know, comes up with. And I think, I, I wonder, do you know through your research, at what point, how many years ago, the likes of Woolies and Coles decided, shivers, we need to get in this game and we need to rebrand ourselves because we are being pointed as the greedy bad guys of food in terms of, you know, the, the food environments. Um, when do you do – have you got sort of any research that sort of says when they started going, okay, we need to lift our game? And what was that? Like what influenced that? Is it suddenly influencers popping up everywhere and everyone sort of going, you know, being led by this conversation of health? What, what leads to such extreme measures that 10 years ago would look like it would never have happened? Yeah, so so we haven't done research in that area. Um, I think you're right that over the last decade there has been a shift to certainly badging as mm. healthier food Correct. companies. Yes, and I think there's been some good initiatives mm. from from the the supermarket chains. I guess in the end, probably what they are going to need to move to <laughs> also include is the other side of the equation. So they're certainly getting better, I think, at displaying and providing healthier food options. Mm. Um, I don't think there's been any change in you know, buy your two big cases of <laughs> Coke for almost nothing yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. every weekend. So we've done some work on pricing, price promotion. So what's on special, yeah. you know, and unhealthy food and drink are yeah. on special all the time. Right. And it's a huge driver of consumers. So you know, we've done some really interesting work with some of the smaller supermarket chains like the IGAs where yeah. they've been really willing to promote um, in quite a serious way the, the healthier options. And also in a way that says that's an unhealthy option, you might want to consider the healthier option, you know, one aisle along. So that's quite brave and and real leadership from them, I think. And they have found really large increases in fruit and veg with no drop have in they? sales. Yeah. So I think the I think supermarkets can do more to really increase the the, the consumption and purchasing or the, of healthier food. And I think that's great. Like I think a lot of the metro supermarkets um, from Victoria to Western Australia, I've seen them with fantastic healthy pre-prepared options. And we really want to see more of that. That's definitely, I agree with you. Yeah. But I guess um, if at the same time, every end of aisle display, every end of checkout is, you know, huge discounts for the unhealthiest food options, mm. then the balance will never be mm. redressed. So mm. it's it's a difficult, I think, retail mm. um, truth that we need to see some decrease in the sales of the unhealthy food and drink, as well as an increase in the sales of healthy. And with a, a, a smaller food retailer, yep. um, in terms of you having discussions or influencing them to to um, increase, you know, healthy healthier foods... Do they look at it um, because they are sort of probably seen as a little bit more the local guys because they're smaller and they, you know, promote, look, food, you know, local footy clubs and stuff like that. Do they is it, do they see things as, okay, we will do it in the areas that there is a, a bigger demand? Like are, are some of those smaller um, food retailers more conscious on this is my, this is the area here. I can't be selling them healthy food. They don't want it. I guess the best answer to your question is that the retailers, the supermarkets that mm. we've worked with are in quite um, disadvantaged regional areas. Mm. And actually, I think the hook that we've observed in all the leaders, whether it's been the YMCA or the health services or, you know, Wyndham and Melton Sport and Recreation Centres or these smaller supermarkets, the hooks have been um, a real sense of connection with their community mm. and a real sense of the importance of doing something good for their community, mm. given the bounds of their own reality. And so what they've wanted the research for is to find out how much good can they do for their communities mm. and still be viable as a business. And mm. I think that's where the opportunity really is. You know, we've really found, um, so with Alfred Health, you know, that we found they basically the retailers decided to do something completely novel, which they'd never done. No, no one had ever done it in mm. the whole world. So it's been publicised now across the whole world where they didn't want to remove choice. So they said, we'll put the unhealthiest drinks behind the counter so no one can see them. So they're still there. We don't feel like we've taken choice away. The consumer can still ask for them, but they can't see them in the fridge where mm -hmm. they go and choose their own drink. 
And the retailer said, I, I think nothing will change. They'll just ask for all the yeah, same Yeah, they're coming they in with it before. in their head. That's right. But actually what we found was before that happened, around 40% of all the drinks sold were what we would call kind of, you know, sugary drinks or mm. soft drinks. And after that happened, less than 10% wow. of all the drinks sold were soft drinks with no change in drink sales at all. So people just bought what was in the fridge. They came in for a drink. They looked in the fridge. They went, oh, mineral water, great. I'll take that instead. Mm. And the retailer is a complete convert. So he's kept that going for three years now. And I think wow. I think there is a real opportunity to work with retailers in particular because they know their communities. They know mm. how to sell food. Mm. You know, that's their expertise. So to work with them and find out what can they do to help their consumers to purchase healthier food and drink and still remain viable. Mm. That to me sort of says of the human race's tendency to be lazy and sheep like what and I'm not knocking it I'm absolutely one of those uh, some of the time but I'm getting better and better but that's because all environments are starting to improve to be honest because I'm not the face of healthy food um but I will go in and kind of go oh, okay yep oh, okay yep so I can be sort of lazy and, and a bit sheep like that but, but then I think it, just rather than calling it yeah. lazy and sheep like, yeah. I mean, I just think it's a natural human tendency to want to be part of a group, to develop habits, um, you know, to go with the prevailing culture of your social group. Mm. So I think that's really normal. Mm. And I don't, I don't think it's just about being lazy. I think mm. that's what makes us feel good to belong, to connect. And so the more you can normalise um, healthier options, mm. the easier it gets, I think, for people to choose them. How will you change tomorrow? Design a future beyond your own. Design a future that makes a difference. Deakin's research students are the best and the brightest with access to global leading researchers, world-class facilities, industry partnerships and innovative research centres designing cutting-edge solutions that make an impact. Become a change maker. Become a Deakin research student. To discover more, go to deakin.edu.au slash research. Deakin, more than a university. What is your research showing and how do you go about working with schools in terms of changing the understanding of where the kids and parents view f food environments and nutrition? Yeah, so my research hasn't focused on schools particularly, mm. but there are a lot of organisations that do work with schools, mm. researchers and government and, and non-government. And I think there are a lot of things that happen through schools. Mm. Um, you know, so it's in the curriculum. Healthy eating is, is part of the curriculum. Mm. Cooking, um, food tech are still part of the curriculum in 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 many schools. And then I think there is a real sense of um, you know there are breakfast clubs. Um, I know in Victoria they introduced this year. Now there's going to be lunch as well for for children who are eligible for breakfast clubs. Oh, right. So I think and even school holiday lunches, so that when they're not coming to school, they still get a nutritious lunch wow. during the school holidays. And there are things happening around the country in that ilk. So I think that there is a good understanding mm. that school is an important component of that. But I think that a lot more could be done. And mm. so, you know, as an example, we have healthy school canteen guidelines um, and they do set really good standards for providing healthy food at school. Mm. Um, but they're not really audited or monitored or enforced. So there's mm. a lot more that could be done. But I guess the, the really exciting thing to me is that we know that if you do have these strong policies mm. and, as, as you said, if you do communicate well with the broader community, mm. not just the, you know, the school or the early learning centre – it can have an impact. So in, in Victoria, as in many other places, there are really strong guidelines for early learning centres. And we, we had one research project where we interviewed a whole lot of parents from quite a disadvantaged area. Mm. And one of the really common themes that came out was that the parents said over and over, oh, yeah, we're really good now with water in the drink bottle, only water, because that's what my child learnt at, at kinder or early, early right. childhood centre, and it came home. So they brought the information so, home. And not just the information but the habit. Yeah. I want my drink bottle and I want it filled with water. Yes. And so you can really, I think, do a lot by having quite clever and strong policies yeah. in all those settings where children grow up. Well, that also goes back to what you were saying when I was calling myself lazy is that we want to feel part of something and certainly children they want to be that you know they're they're good by nature they want to feel part of something and when the 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 larger part of that or or, or pleasing a teacher is you know water's a really great thing for your brain and everything um I can see how 
you know, they can take that home and be very excited about that. Yeah. And I think a lot of this research area is about trying to break down some of what are seen as myths and some of the myths that are propagated, I think, by the food industry. Mm. Um, so they will often say that what they provide and what they put on special is because it's what's on what's demanded by people. Mm. But actually, you know, there's so much good research now showing that if you can really make um, water mm. <laughs> in a drink bottle fun and exciting, yeah. and if you have fruit, kids love fruit. Yeah. Actually, that's what they'll demand. Yes. So, so it is about setting up the food environments to support our kids and our children's children, mm. really to develop the ha- habits that are going to help their health. So with all of that, right, so obviously there is definitely, um, there's obviously still b- big problems and and obviously the diseases that you, we touched on earlier are still huge burdens on our health system. Um, with, I guess, the change that you're seeing whether that's through schools, whether that's the big retailers, small retailers, um, you know, the YMCA's of the world, is there like, do you have sort of forecasted if things still keep going and if there is a snowball effect in the positive, when um, the likelihood of seeing significant kind of decreases in the burden on the health system in regards to diseases and, and, you know, uh, bad food choices, like how does that look? Yeah. How does the future kind of look? Do you have that or is it a guessing That's a really game? Good question. Oh, look, of course, the future is always a guessing game. Yeah. But an educated guess would say, yeah. I think, I mean, I, I guess my vision at the moment, and I think it's a realistic one, if I just yeah. look at Victoria, mm-hmm. is that within five years, um, you know, we could potentially have every early childhood centre, every school, every health service, every sport and rec, every university providing healthy food as the baseline, wow. you know, as yeah. the standard. Mm. I think that's achievable, yeah. you know, and we've got some fantastic research, some fantastic connections and fantastic champions. And I think that's a potentially realistic goal. Mm. It's a hard one. Mm. <laughs> but so that's that's one area. I think in terms of um, your question around and then when are we going to start to see real flow through, yeah. obviously we do need change through the big supermarkets if yeah. we're going to see flow through because that's 60% of our food. I think that's a longer game and I think that's working both with the consumer and the producers and suppliers, like we need all food manufacturers probably to be part of that journey. Mm -hmm. And so that might take another five years, so let's say 10 years. Um, Then I think we'll see a really substantial shift in our children's diets and our children's weight. So at the moment, a quarter of Australian children are overweight or obese. Um, I think we could realistically see a decrease in that in 10 years if all those different stakeholders played their role. Mm -hmm. That will obviously, you know, they have to grow up before they get sick. So I think it will take a long time before we see change in really the disease burden. Mm. Um, And that's why it can be really difficult for government to act. But I guess what I hope is that they have the vision and enough care for our children and our children's children Mm. that they will act now to improve the adult health of our children today. Mm. So what is it, why why this subject and why this research Mm -hmm. for you? Like what, what? How did you get into this area? Like what, what excites you? Yeah, it's a really good question. I find it really interesting. Yeah, um, I think it that, is. Yeah, I think that's one of the big areas. So I've come through a very traditional molecular science background mm. and then I moved to kind of more public health because I thought I'd like to think about things during my work life that I like to think about during my day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I'm really interested in in what can we do to help everybody to have better health and wellbeing. Mm. And so I really was never wedded to a topic area. It was what's some research that's going to help make decisions that will improve health and wellbeing for everyone. So really equity, improvement in health outcomes. And that journey, it struck me that um, obesity and healthy diets are so complex that it would be really fun for a long time to think about it. To pull it apart. Mm. And to work with different stakeholders and see things from different perspectives. I really like that. um, Like in terms of like you being, uh, you know, Anna in your own world outside of your work, do you, you know, like your loved ones, like do you, does it become the more you know, the more difficult it is to see the average kind of person maybe eating in a way that you can see may lead to health issues in the part? Like how how does your research and kind of like work spill over to your personal life with your loved ones? It definitely does, but I think I'm very strongly focused on the big players that have influence. Right, yeah. And so – 
Yeah, you I know, get I it. will not be. I am not the person in any crowd who eats the healthiest food yeah. or avoids the the junk food. I kind of accept that that's how I grew up, and mm. they're my habits. And yes, I would like to be as healthy as I can, but I'm not. I'm not. You know, I'm not a food person yeah. really. And with my teenage children, um, it's an ongoing battle, definitely, to try and say these are the health things. We have to keep thinking about the health things. But, um, you know, I'm really happy to have a pizza on a Friday night. So mm. so I don't personalise it at that level. I think that it, to me it's it's any other element. It's the same as any other element of health and wellbeing. I do my best. We do our best mm. as a family. But what I do see all the time is is the influences on our mm. behaviour and our choices. And I think that's what I find really interesting. So when my 15-year-old son comes home and says, um, you know, one of his friends has a fast food app that, told them all to go to that fast food outlet after school that night and he would have preferred the sushi because he just really likes sushi, yeah. but that would have been more expensive and here they were all getting $1, whatever they were getting. I think that's outrageous. Yes. You know, so definitely it's personal at that level. Yeah. But it's not, not about me and, and my behaviour, but mm. really about the influences. Yeah, right. So you put down a new to-do list for the next day. Right, so pretty and much. so, <laughs> I'm coming for you. Yeah, pretty much. What about some, I mean, you know, an, another big kind of move in the sort of, you know, health education and food um, arena has uh, is like all these incredible documentaries and documentaries just full stop becoming, you know, widely consumed by people. Um, you know, there was obviously a, a little while back that Sugar Films or, or Super Size Me was probably one of the first ones that sort of, you know, um, made big waves. Um, the Australian one, which I haven't seen yet, called Rotten. Have you seen any of those docu- documentaries and which one or which ones really impressed you that got you excited? Yeah, well, actually the ones you just talked about. So I saw Super Size Me very early on yeah. in my move into this kind of field and it really excited me yeah. because it was looking at, you know, how does the system drive our behaviour? Yeah. Um, and that's obviously what really interests me. So I really, I thought, and it was one of the first times I think we'd really seen the food system mm. being called out as um, a driver of totally. our behaviour in such a clear and distinct way. I also really enjoyed that sugar film, and I think mm. what that made me think about is um, it. You know, there are so many different people in our society, so many different cultures, so many different ages. We just need to get better at communicating with all of them and mm. trying to find out what are the actions and the messages that are going to resonate for those mm. groups. Mm. So I think that sugar film had a really lovely tone to it and it really engaged a whole lot of people who probably weren't previously engaged. Mm. And my current thinking, probably because I have teenage children, is, you know, we really need to have an adolescent, I think, marketing campaign yeah. around healthy food that is targeted at all those things that influence them in daily life because we don't know. Like we've yeah. got no idea about – well, I have no idea. I don't speak for you. I have no idea about, you know, Snapchat and Instagram. Yeah, and totally. Well, I didn't even know that the the, the um, food – some of those food chains um, – or, you know, I'm not going to but say it's a KFC. I don't know that for a fact, but I didn't even know that they had yeah. apps. And, oh, and they like have that. really powerful apps, really, really strongly influencing our children and our adolescents' behaviour. They are they are unbelievable. And so I feel like you almost so need creepy. an adolescent army to take that on because we don't know what's happening to them. You know, I was actually going to say to you, if someone came to you and said, right, I've got, you know, $500,000 and I, I'm going to give that to you to make a documentary, what would that be on? Yeah. Would it be on something like, you know, yeah. I think these, that's the next wave. Yeah. yeah, these brands coming for our teenagers. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, well, I think I would have two. <laughs> yeah. So I think one would be about um, going back to the sort of research stuff we've talked about. It would be really highlighting the change agents in the food retail sector because yeah. I think that's a myth we have to bust that change isn't possible and consumers won't. Buy healthy so food. something that's positive to say, hey, right. change Look is what's happening. happening. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, like rather five... than feeling disempowered, go no, 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 no. Correct. You can feel empowered, Correct. but jump on it and and, and you know keep we the snowball going the right way. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, five years ago, almost no sport and rec centres across Victoria had healthy food. It's crazy, isn't it? Five years and now is nothing. It's you know there are almost a hundred. Mm-hmm. So that's a huge step yeah. change. So, yes, I think that would be one. But the other would definitely yeah, be. Yeah, that's nice. I like that. Teenagers. Yes. Yeah. Done by them, spoken by them. Because as you said, we, we, this is this is like this, you know, the, the loophole I think um, with these brands is most of us don't know where they're coming at them. That's right. Because we're not Snapchat. We're not, I'm not like all of these apps. We exactly. don't know. So, 
you know, we've got to kind of like go know where to be checking. That's right. And not and only calling where to out. Check, but then what do you do about it? That's right. Yeah. I'm sure they could develop some fantastic apps for healthy food stores. That's um that's really interesting. Well, I would I would definitely watch both of those. So as we come to the end of this episode, um, in conclusion, what would what would you just like to sort of put out there? If you if a newsletter was dropped on every Australian's doorstep tomorrow, what would you like them to know in terms of what you know and what your research is showing you about food? Probably two main things. I think one is that um, we have a lot of the tools in our toolkit that we need to make our food environments much healthier over the next five to ten years and calling on everyone to consider their own sphere of influence to think about whether you're the CEO of a big food company or um, a really substantial member of a health service or the the head of your local sports club, what could you do Mm. to make your food environments help your communities eat better? Or a cafe owner. Correct. Local cafe owner. That's right. Because you can be part of the solution Mm. and still have a viable business. Mm. And, And so I think that's the first main thing. I guess the second thing I would say is that Um, You know, it's really important that we move forward on this journey to try and provide healthier food environments, to support better health across our communities, always taking into account the fact that food has more than one function, that that it has both a social function Mm, um, and a pleasure function, as well as what we're trying to do in terms of increasing its capacity to support health. Wow. Well, it's certainly one of the most important subjects in our life, and you're definitely uh, making it a lot more interesting. And I I hope uh, this inspires people to really be, I I think for me, just uh, what I've got out of it so much is recognising those food environments that are everywhere that I go and being more conscious when I'm in them to deciding, you know, what I'm going to purchase and what I'm going to, you know, take on. And maybe you can also ask all your local cafes and supermarkets Mm. to um, change for the better. Yeah, exactly. Take away the... uh, the cookies with the Smarties and, you know, put some nice uh, organic, uh, what are they, the little balls? <laughs> and they don't even have to be organic. No, well, that's, that's exactly <laughs> true. Thank you so much for your chat today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining in the conversation with us about our healthcare system. If you'd like more information on any of the topics or researchers in this series, simply head to iht.deacon.edu.au.